Welcome to Podcast Biotech Nation. This is a series of podcasts focused specifically on the biomedical and HTM industry. Episodes will be added monthly. Listening to each episode is eligible for one continuing education credit from the ACI. At the conclusion of this episode, you'll be able to access a link that will take you to a quick survey. You'll be able to download your certificate once you submit the survey. Before we begin today's podcast, I'd like to invite you to save the date for our upcoming MD Expo in Atlanta on April 11th through the 13th, 2022. You can find more details and registration for the show at mdexposhow.com. Podcast by Technation would like to thank our sponsor, Nuvolo. Nuvolo is the only software company that offers a connected workplace for healthcare solutions, a modern-day CMMS combined with the capabilities of an integrated workplace management system. Nuvolo helps HTM departments make better clinical and operational decisions, and automated workflows make your job easier. For more information, please visit nuvolo.com. In today's episode, we are joined by a panel of experts, including Ben Person, Chief Marketing Officer of Nuvolo, Blake Collins, Director of Clinical Engineering of Christiana Care, Carter Groom, CEO of First Health Advisory, Barbara McGuire, VP of Healthcare Technology Management of ISS Solutions and Geisinger Health Systems, Mark Manning, Division Chair of Healthcare Technology Management of Mayo Clinic, and Tom Tachalaski, Assistant Director of Healthcare Product Alerts at ECRI. Panelists, you may begin whenever you are ready. All right, welcome, and thanks for joining today's podcast. You know, we're going to dive in today to a team with a team of HTM experts to really talk about data management in your CMMS. Every hospital I've ever spoken with that talks about managing data within that CMS because of all aspects, operational reporting, financial reporting, compliance reporting, right? And now cybersecurity becomes a major topic. And we have a panel of experts today. They're going to dive right into that. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce the team here today that are going to talk about this topic. So my name is Ben Pearson. I'm our chief marketing officer at Novolo. By the way, uh, my wife's a clinical engineer, so I've been in this market for quite some time, both professionally and personally, and really excited to talk more about uh, with these experts, kind of how are they seeing data management across the board? With me, though, I have Blake Collins, who's the Director of Clinical Engineering at Christiana Care. We also have Carter Groom, who's the CEO at First Health Advisory. And Carter's going to dive into cybersecurity specifically and why data management matters so much as we think about protecting these connected medical devices. Barbara McGuire is here. She's our Vice President of Healthcare Technology Management at ISS Solutions and Geisinger Health Systems. Mark Manning is here as the Division Chair of Healthcare Technology Management at Mayo Clinic. And last but not least is Tom Tocholowski, who's the Assistant Director of Healthcare Product Alerts at ECRI. And ECRI, we'll talk more about in a second about kind of their role when we think about safety and recalls and alerts and notifications and why data matters there as well. Without further ado, let's dive into the very first question. And Mark, I'm going to have you take this one first and kind of the things you look at when you're running the HTM business at Mayo Clinic. This is something, by the way, we absolutely can talk about for a long time, all day probably. But when you think about those data decisions that you're making, you know, what are some of those day-to-day things you're looking at as it, as you look at governing the data within your CMMS at Mayo? Sure. Thanks, Ben. And thanks for having me. This is a, really a multi-layered question, right? So I'll start high level and kind of get into some of the specifics and, uh, you know, across the continuum of maturity with our program here at Mayo. So at, at the highest of level, we, we really need to use our data for day-to-day uh break, fix, uptime, uh, and accreditation. We're over 136,000 assets now. We also manage on the cyber and connectivity side about 13,000 assets from the facilities IoT side. So of our 136, we've got 41,000 that can be connected, another 13. Data drives pretty much everything we do. With some of our uh, our assets specifically, we have over 400, I think the number is actually 412 specific attributes or columns or you know pieces of information related to a single device. So our number one priority is keeping the equipment up and running and safe. We use the data, you know, <laughs> minute to minute every day, all day long for that, of course. As we've advanced or, or become more mature with uh, how we operate and what we do for the organization, gotten much deeper or much more uh, complex with what we do with the data. 
moving toward things such as a uh, cost of service ratio, total cost of ownership related to specific types of equipment, use our, our data very heavily to build new business plans to insource more support on equipment and drive out expense for the organization as a whole. We've been very, very successful with that. And a lot of it's attributed to having the data available. The future for us, you know, we need to keep doing everything that I've already mentioned. Plus, uh, we're actually building new metrics um, you know, one that's called capital avoidance value that we'll, uh, we'll share later on this year. So we're constantly evolving, moving, changing. What can we do with the data now that we have it shored up and in really good shape and, uh, you know, more accurate than it's ever been? Our relationship with supply chain, with audit, with information security, et cetera, has also matured incredibly because of what we're able to bring to the table with accurate data. It's a lot of key data points, Mark, for sure. I guess maybe maybe mention a little bit of kind of that balance between measurement on your side, Mark, and, you know, obviously as a leader in HTM, there's certain data points you have to have accurate, right? When clinical engineers are filling out work orders and processing data. Is there that, can you talk a little bit about that balance maybe between uh, requiring a lot of data and the productivity requirements of HTM? I'm just curious as to your perspective on that as well. I'd have to go high level with that again too. So really we've stepped up our game a lot on the financial side of it, the value equation side of it. So why are we here? What are we doing compared to other options for leadership within the organization, specifically with the CFO and the CAO? If we relate that now uh, away from enterprise business, that lens and go to the the technician lens, it's more of a clean data makes their job and their work easier. It's more precise. So ticket came in, it came in the right way with the right information. I know where it is. I know the situation with the contract or lack thereof. I know the situation with parts or lack thereof. We really have focused on taking as much uh, of the data entry and uh, sometime with our mobile devices or keystrokes with our computers away from the technicians, automating as much as we can in a standard sense. So, th- so things are much more predictable. So less of the, what I experienced, you know, 15 years ago when I was in the field of uh, uh, a ticket came in, roll the dice. Is, is the information accurate? Is the thing even still here? Is it connected to the net network? Uh, there's just so many things that we cleaned up and made a much more predictable experience for our technician, thus getting better value uh, for them as an expensive asset to the, to the organization, uh, making their time worth it. And quite honestly, delivering a lot more job satisfaction to the techs. For sure, Mark, that's a great, that's a great point. You know, working on things that are really in your system and and, and accurate uh, makes a big difference in productivity, right? That's great. That's great. Blake or Barbara, any other comments on that as well? Sure. So I I would echo a lot of what Mark said as far as the uses of the data, and it's certainly evolved over the last several years as we've gotten more capability from our CMMS. So now we're able to not only use the data within HTM, but to make that information available to other either clinical departments or supply chain so that if they need to access information about medical um, equipment inventory, they can do that as well. And because we're able to customize the information, we can present them, present the information to them in a way that's meaningful to them through different dashboards and reports. So I think, you know, that's really been a big step forward as opposed to them, you know, asking us for information. And it's just the information within the HTM department, but we're able to share that um, effectively. That's great. Having that data available for other departments to leverage it to your point, Barbara, you know, that's really important. And it's allowing them to self-service get that data, you know, as opposed to it being a request every time, right? So let's dive into the second question, Blake, it's actually tease it up well. Can you share a little bit of a situation where, you know, either in your current role or a previous role, where not having good data in your CMMS made your job more difficult or caused you problems for your team or the hospital? Maybe you have some specific examples there. Yeah, actually, um, you know, when we talk about good data, uh, I kind of look at it two different ways is one is good data being accurate data in the system or a lack of data in the system uh, when, when we're talking about that. So for the first being, you know, the not having good data. Um, I'm sure everyone or most everyone is familiar with when the M Chimera issue hit and we had the heater cooler is, um, machines within our uh, operating rooms. And 
it really was a, a, an infectious area that was going in and, and, and we had to go in and research what devices we had, where we had them, what maintenance was done. And going into, and, and this went back many, many years. So I'm, I'm three databases in, wow. you know, from when those were really, uh, you know, hitting when a lot of that started. So um, going back to prior to me being here and going back to that third uh, legacy database is looking for those heater coolers and what maintenance was done on them at the time. And when looking for them, it really, it depended on how I looked as to what data I was getting. So for instance, if I was looking up by the asset type, it said, hey, you have three of them. If I looked it up by the manufacturer, it said I had four of them. If I looked it up by, you know, uh, 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 you know, whatever different thing I, I had, you know, when like um, uh, three, you know, I, it, again, just getting differing numbers, depending on which way I would look at it. And that was really causing us issues, especially because this was legal um, uh, being responsible. We, you know, we, as, as many other folks were getting, um, uh, legal pressure, putting everything together, but, you know, as we, we had to go in and, and present to our legal teams, you know, what data we had, you know, that was causing them some questions as well. Wait a minute. How many do we have? Which way are you looking at it? Are you sure this is what we have? And, you know, it really caused some concert consternation as to what we really had. Uh, the second being lack of data was um, uh, more recent was the WannaCry virus when that came out, you know, is uh, how many devices do we have that actually connect to the network? What does that look like? Um, that's where a lack of data was. We don't really know what we have, where we have it, what's connected to the network, which one has antivirus, which one doesn't. And so that really caused us to chase our tails, probably more so than we wanted to, obviously. Uh, so that was actually a driver to put in different uh, mitigating um, uh, structures that we have currently now. But that was a real big, you know, a wake up call is to our lack of data and what we need to really put into into place to to prevent that from happening again. Like those are perfect examples. Now, first example, did did you have to like send send a clinical engineer out or send a facilities tech out to go physically validate the inventory amounts? Is that how you yes, solved we that? Did. Yes, we did. Yeah. So we couldn't just pull it up. We had to go out and say, all right, how many do I have? Go 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 search the ORs. And, and pull them out and let's let's go from there. Unfortunately, you know, uh, uh, for those familiar with this, is you couldn't just stop using them at that time. You really, you know, until you got replacements and we couldn't get replacements. So it it was kind of a compounding issue on that. But uh, yeah, we had to actually go out and physically grab them. What is the asset? What is the control number? And look them up individually wow. to see what the data was that I had on them. So that's quite time intensive for sure, you know, and obviously that was a smaller volume, but the, the, the wanna cry example, or even more recently, the blue keep example, similar story, right? All of a sudden everybody's calling saying, Hey, I don't know how many of these medical devices are running this operating system in this version. Uh, I'm going to physically have to send people around to go figure this out. And in some cases it was infusion pumps. It was, you know, significant volume of medical devices that, I have to put hands on potentially to validate the environment, right? Is that, is that kind of what you ran into there too, Blake? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Very time yeah. consuming, very troubling. And obviously it was a very high profile. So you have a lot of eyes on it and um, it really was a, um, you know, yeah, we, 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 we made a mistake. We didn't, we didn't know what we didn't know basically at that time. So uh, now we know better hopefully, and uh, we'll be prepared uh, for that in the future. It's great, Blake. I mean, think about that, removing all these resources from corrective and, and preventative and planned maintenance over to now physically going and touching devices to protect yourself from a cybersecurity risk, right? So Definitely a resource draw, that's for sure. For sure, for sure. Um, Mark or Barbara, any comments on that from your side as well? I'd echo and add, I mean, WannaCry was, uh, you know, it, it really uh, made it up well with the cliche, uh, let no good crisis go to waste. Um, I think for us, it was 5,400 things we needed to go touch and we needed to quantify that financially. We brought in contractors. It was, it was quite a change. So, and then Blake's touching the, com, uh, you know, compliance and completeness 
of data, as we refer to it on the IT side of the things. Um, we're held to a different uh, measuring stick these days within this organization. I know that. So with the agents that are available on the, uh, you know, the easy stereotypical IT side, uh, agents and tools, uh, we need to rise up to that challenge differently to meet the same requirements as, uh, mm -hmm. as they're delivering on the IT side. Back to data, though, uh, you know, 10 years ago when I was actually a technician and had good skills, for me, it was an older database. I, I was looking at the value of myself to this organization. I, you know, I ran spreadsheets. I had notes. I did all kinds of things outside of the system, specifically for my equipment, you know, heart-lung machines, balloon pumps, ventricular assist devices. I was a cardiac guy. We had all these piggyback non-connected systems that uh, it just doesn't function in, in today's world. So uh, definitely uh, needed to change. It's quite impressive. Mark, you're right. We basically added a whole new stack of work on top of HTM that really we didn't think about from a resourcing perspective until the last few years. You know, I mean, it's amazing what I'd be very interested in seeing, you know, that PM completion and compliance uh, while the WannaCry was going on, while the Blue Keep was going on, because we had to shift those resources in a lot of cases. Thankfully, Mark, you were able to bring on some additional headcount and resources contractors to go, you know, get it done uh, during those additional additional projects, right? So interesting, interesting. Let's, let's click into the next question. Barbara, I'm going to have you take this one. You know, if we can talk a little bit about some of the improvements that you've put into your CMMS you know, we think about data management and even what tools you're using for that, Barbara. So at ISS Solutions, we manage over 160,000 devices for Geisinger, our parent, as well as our other commercial clients. So we've, we're always looking at ways to improve the data we collect. And also to your point, Ben, you know, the efficiency and the way we do that. So how can we streamline processes for our technicians? So we're fortunate that we have a team of um, uh, CMMS administrators who are certified in ServiceNow, and they're also former technicians and supervisors. So they know the workflow that they're dealing with, and they've been able to um, constantly improve our CMMS to configure it for the business processes we need. So one example of that is, you know, adding information for alarms, PHI capable, and looking at ways that we track uh, medical equipment that does store PHI um, in a more focused way. Mm -hmm. So we used to have a process where, you know, the technician would have to document that they screened a device for PHI when it was disposed of. Mm -hmm. And then we'd audit that after the fact, and we'd find sometimes that step was missed or the step was done, but not documented. So we were able to um, develop some business rules that would look at, does the device contain PHI, then automatically create a work order that the technician then has to complete to document, you know, did they not find PHI? Did they find it and um, remove it from the device and document how they did that? Um, so that really helped us improve our compliance that we make sure we're complying with those ISO policies. Um, and it improved the workflow for the technicians because they only had to do that where it applied for devices with PHI. So that's one example of how we improved it using our own in-house resources. And then we're currently working on um, enhancing that information even further with medical device discovery tools, tools like Assimilate, Medigate, and there are others that can enhance the data we collect and integrate that information with our CMMS. So that again, we're reducing the amount of time the technicians have to spend manually collecting and updating that data. And then it will also help us to manage uh, security vulnerabilities in a more enhanced way than we do now. Barbara, talk about process automation and workflow. The first example I love actually, because you're taking that risk out of the HTM, the clinical engineer's hands to some extent, you're automating that, right? If it's a PHI medical device that stores or, or transmits PHI and that needs to be wiped as part of the decommissioning process, you now have an automation step with, with full auditability, by the way, for Joint Commissioner DNV to make sure that this device was, in fact, you know, clean before uh, we disposed of it. I mean, that's and that's that's amazing. That you now have that fully uh, workflowed and automated, so the clinical engineer doesn't have to think about that as part of their manual process. Yeah, that's really helped us improve compliance and make sure that step doesn't get forgotten. It's great, Barbara. And if you think about the second one, you look at cybersecurity. You know, to your point, there's monitoring and discovery tools now that have come to market in the last five years that you know allow you to also 
ongoing, keep information up to date within your CMMS, right? Making sure that as your medical devices are, are you know, changing IP addresses, MAC addresses, software versions, firmware versions, and information critical to the cybersecurity program, that that data can be automatically fed in to your CMMS from those monitoring providers. Yeah, that's really a key enhancement because there's so much more information now that we're expected to um, maintain on medical devices and that mm -hmm. those types of tools can really help us um, use our resources in the best way. That's great. And Barbara, I know we're gonna talk more about cybersecurity in a minute, but um, you know, the, the case of, of folks having siloed monitoring, OT security monitoring, medical device security monitoring tools separate from your CMMS, you know, it's so important that those are tied together, right? And I know uh, when we get into Carter's section, we're going to dive a little deeper into that, which we'll touch on here in a second. But Barbara, those are great examples. Next, Mark, this one's for you. So if we look at your external services and applications, you know, it's one of the common questions is kind of what other systems you tied your CMMS in with, right? What have you integrated it to? And and even talk about, let's talk about some of those use cases. Why did you integrate? And what was sort of the business outcome you're trying to get through those integrations? And then also, if you can tie it in maybe a little bit to some of your naming conventions of your of your standards you're running within your CMMS, kind of how did that, how did, why did that, you know, matter? What, what, what outcome did you get out of that? Sure. Uh, so I'll kind of go sideways into that, Ben. So uh, back up the history of this organization uh, that, that I, I'm so proud to lead today within Mayo. Six years ago, we were uh, 13 different organizations operating independently with a whole lot of different ideas about not just what we should call or name things, but, uh, you know, business ops, what we should and shouldn't do, et cetera. So uh, we're all on one system now. We're all standard with uh, the naming conventions. There's still a subtle cleanup that needs to happen within our own house, so to say. But much like Barbara, we have people that are specifically hired and designated to take care of that. And we just we just hired another six people to do that type of work. So we're going for the, the end game now. So external integrations, uh, ECRI, of course, part source order for our, our, our agentless uh, tool. Uh, one source service now, Lawson. And then, you know, external to us with, with a large corporation, much like my peers here, um, that can mean many different things sometimes. So we integrate to also to WARS, which is a work area resource uh, services. So what building, what floor, what room, standard nomenclature across the board. That was a huge win for us and took many years uh, to kind of come together with those folks. Uh, CMDB is a huge integration for us. Uh, so the configuration management database. Um, we're uh, aligned with IT and actually our completeness and compliance is, and depending on uh, which, which direction you look at it from, uh, can be better than theirs, which is uh, pretty impressive considering we don't have that, the extent of tools that they use uh, every day. We're also integrated with uh, our, our real-time location services. So in this case, it's BlueFi. We've got, uh, I think, 25,000 assets tagged uh, across the, uh, the enterprise today. We're integrated with a Sense, SenseTrack, so the Linen Central Service tool that they use to track processing, reprocessing stuff for our portable equipment where it's centralized, infusion pumps, wound backs, et cetera. So we're, we're heavily integrated, some of those to a lesser extent, some to a greater extent. Um, the, the one that we're working on right now is to integrate order with Nuvolo more heavily. Essentially, our, our vulnerability management program is completely built per documentation and ready to roll. It's aligned with information security's VM program. We just need that connection to happen. Then uh, all, all roads will lead back to IS for reporting and, and tracking. So did I cover that, Ben? You sure did, Mark. Oh, wow. Thank you. Wow. I didn't, I didn't realize there were that many integration points, but you touched on two that really stood out to me that, you know, one, you're, you're using the same language, the same data sources and standards, IT and facilities. So your space data, you have one source of truth now. You know, every most hospitals I talk to, you know, your clinical engineering department has their space hierarchy, location hierarchy, and the facilities has their own separate one. You know, just think about like beds, for example, that have to be supported by facilities and, and clinical engineers and IT together, right? So, but by using... So the same standards for space data, for IT in the configuration management database, you guys are all able to collaborate probably like never before. 
there, right? Yep. Tickets can transfer seamlessly through ServiceNow. So the advantage we have is that we foster this relationship with uh, facilities operations. So they also use the same CMMS as we do. So uh, there's a lot of cohesiveness uh, across the board with facilities ops, HTM, and IT. And we've we've really politicked well to, to make that happen. That's great, Mark. Uh, Blake or Barbara, any comments from your side as well on that or any other integrations that maybe you want to mention? Yeah, so we we have a couple very similar to what Mark has done. The one area when we're talking about where I think that goes into the locations is we also, we also have HR on our uh, service now and the locations and which people are where that are assigned to which devices for the business devices and all of that helps um, uh, you know, get coordinated as well. Uh, the other thing that we have is uh, we, we have used our, uh, we have Centrac and Centani is our uh, RTLS system and Metagate. And we have those uh, uh, integrated into our uh, CMMS and we built a custom uh, profile that we use for uh, equipment tracking and par leveling for the system. And Metagate gives us utilization as well as with the Centrac location and with us and our asset and, and Nuvolo being sort of the, 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 the source of truth for all these different areas. And so we can set up um, um, equipment tracking for, for, for instance, IV pumps. Each floor has X amount of pumps. I can tell how long a pump or a channel has been in an area, uh, whether it's on, whether it's being used. Uh, if it's not, then we can go grab that device and put it back into circulation so that our uh, capital expenditure is lower and, you know, we have a higher, much higher utilization uh, in the past, you know, people, you know, when we've, we've researched that, you know, if you get, you know, 20, 30% utilization out of an IV pump, you're doing really good. And we're getting in that uh, high sixties, low 70% utilization in our IV pumps, which, you know, really saves us from having to buy, you know, uh, you know, at one point, I think we did a thing. It was several million dollars worth of IV pumps that we did not have to buy, which goes to what Mark was talking about earlier. And that that capital value, uh, I believe that's what you call it, capital uh, uh, avoidance value, which I like that term. And, but that that really is, you know, that that's that's big, you know, to, to be able yeah. to put that. The other small thing that we have, and I'll call it small, is a Kronos integration mm-hmm. is where it's just very simple for us to know are my technicians clocked in or are they not uh, for our dispatching of calls? You know, have they gone in? And then the uh, the side piece is so I can look at uh, clocked hours versus worked hours. It's not productivity. It's more of a just a are you here or are you not? And then productivity, you know, that's another big animal we could talk about for another hour on it on itself. But we use that just as a, you know, documented time, so to speak, is what is your documented time and then productivity being a subset of that. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, those are some of the things that we've put in. The part source, I'll say the big benefit to that one is parts accuracy, what I have, what do I have, the inventory of what I have and the utilization of that and being able to effectively track those costs. Because that that's one of the hidden areas that you tend to lose focus on, especially in a um, when you have stock rooms and uh, losing losing those costs and, and, and being able to do that. So uh, all of that coming together really, really helps us. And talk about cost avoidance. I, I, I love that story of having a good data set, to your point, tying in with RTLS, tying it in with your monitoring tools for utilization metrics. I mean, wow, if you can, I mean, I, I was talking to some other health systems about this exact topic. How do we prove that this capital request is really needed, right? How do we validate that this capital request, that they don't have too much already? And to your point, Blake, that's a great example of now you having utilization data and being able to make those business decisions, millions of dollars of business decisions around capital uh, purchases or not. That's fantastic. Fantastic, Mark. I like like where you went with that as well, Barbara. Any anything from your side as well on these integrations? Sure. One other one that I'll add is that we do integrate with Active Directory, which has a feed from uh, Lawson that we use as our HR um, database. And what we use that for is to keep up to date the hierarchy of managers to technicians. And we use that for a couple of things. One of which is dispatch. So when we're dispatching a call to a technician. It has a certain set escalation time and then needs to escalate to the next level. So we use that feed to keep up to date on, you know, changes to management structure or 
new people that join and who's reporting to them. And that way we don't have to maintain the same information separately within the goal. It's really important, right, Barbara, making sure work lands in the right hands and not having to manually manage uh, clinical engineering leadership to their teams, right? And so, yeah, that's a, that's a great example of uh, a process automation done right, you know, so that's great. All right, let's move on. Blake, we're going to uh, dive into a question for you here. Let's talk about work order data management. You know, let's talk about like, how are you ensuring, you know, that information that techs are entering is accurate. You know, one of the things I hear a lot is, you know, clients starting with sort of these free form text fields. I think we've all seen it and there's needs for it. All right. When we think about work notes, but talk a little bit about how you're getting the right information from your text as they're doing their work orders. I mean, again, this is another subject we could spend uh, uh, the whole hour talking about on, on work order data, you know, uh, integrity. But a couple of things that we've done is when we moved into Nuvolo specifically, we you have a whole subset of closed codes, resolution codes, you know, cause codes, et cetera. And we we really made a concerted effort to slim that down, you know, the keeping it more simple versus expanding and going out. Um, a lot of folks want to capture and they want to boil the ocean, you know, uh, in, in, in what they're trying to capture in, in, in their data. And I get it and I understand it and there's value, but by keeping your codes simpler, you, you have many different things that could fall under some of those codes. And it makes it easier for my technician to understand. Sometimes people go, well, it's harder. The technicians try to sometimes make it harder. Well, I have this gray area. You do. I get it. You know, not all codes are going to fall, fall under or uh, situations are going to fall under one particular code. But if it more falls, what's good enough? Does it fit in there? And then we can get to some of the detail and the descriptions when you start really looking at the exceptions mm-hmm. that within those data sets versus the, the you know, all the little um, uh, pieces and parts. Because you end up, you know, the old term data uh, uh, um, analysis paralysis. You mm-hmm. end up just looking at so many different areas, you don't look at any. And, and it really ends up being, you know, uh, okay, what did I really get out of all this data collection and where I, where, what, what I've put together? So we keep it slow, uh, you know, uh, 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 more slimmer is better, you know, um, uh, sometimes less information is more uh, and, and really breaking it down where the detail is in the, in the, the summary, you know, what I did and some of that. Um, the second thing that we did, which seems kind of simple, but actually ends up being a uh, very resource draining, but it's value add, which is all work orders. Every work order is reviewed by the supervisor of that technician. So that as the work order, you know, the, the technicians make the work orders and they turn them into what we call the, the code we use is resolved. They have resolved the work. And that's where a lot of the different KPIs and things that we have in place stop for the technician is when they've marked it resolved. But the supervisor is then responsible to go in and we've created dashboards so they can go in and look at what they've documented, how they've done it, you know, and, and the supervisors can, can you know, it, it, as time has gone on, it's gotten easier for them to scan the data and look for what does good look like on these work orders and in the data and, and going through there. And you can see the, is, is, uh, the, the anomalies pretty mm-hmm. quickly as they pop up. Um, and then, the second part of that is after the you know the the supervisors do that, uh, the managers and myself we put a second eye to it. Uh, you know we spot check. We'll just come in and take a look, and that just gives you know you you don't want you know you the blinders. You know the supervisors, technicians they get blinders on, and this helps them kind of hey what what was this what was going on there, and uh, sometimes just having the knowledge that someone else is going to look at your data makes you do better at your data collection uh, and, and, and reporting. So those are just a couple of little small things we, we put together for that. And that last one's a great example, Blake, you know, checks and balances that one, you can catch, to your point, catch anomalies, but also catch where maybe there's, there's training opportunities. Maybe there's opportunities to cross train, you know, skills across your team or where you have, you know, where you have opportunities to, to do some additional, uh, you know, upskilling across your resources. So that's great. It's a great example, Blake. Mark or Barbara, any comments there as well? One of the other things we do for um, both work orders and and asset um, data is to just make sure we have written procedures for what we expect of the technicians, Mm -hmm. make sure they're trained consistently from the start. 
And then we review those procedures annually and as processes are updated. So I think that really helps just to have that consistency. And then we do also, in addition to, as Blake mentioned, having the supervisors review the work orders, we do also have an audit process where someone else not in that um, reporting chain reviews a sample of work orders just to identify if maybe a tech, you know, was misunderstood the instructions or is not keeping up with the level of documentation that we'd expect. So those steps really help, you know, keep the work order data um, consistent as well. That's great. Mark, uh, anything from your side as well? Yeah, just to, you know, for us, the trend is, uh, you know, at a high level, we're, we're, we're trying to switch from, the, you know, old adages here, but uh, garbage in, garbage out to quality and quality out, and then limit the interaction of the number of people. So permission levels have been very important to us. And then uh, we don't do as much of a review with the management side. I think our, our goal is to have folks behind the scenes, uh, I don't know how else to say it, uh, a lower pay grade type jobs to be responsible for that data and then to report up anom anomalies as they see them. We also look for training opportunities. We have training videos in-house that we've built that are online for the technicians. We refer them if we find errors or mistakes to the training videos uh, occasionally. It's all part of the push-pull from the technicians. Uh, their, their time is valuable. They want to spend their, their time, hands-on equipment, uh, you know, in the field. Uh, so we've tried to limit the amount of uh, opportunities for error or failure accidentally within the system more so than auditing afterwards. It's great. Make it easy for them so they can ultimately do their work hands-on to devices and less data entry into work orders, right? Got it. Got it. That's great. All right. Question six, Bar, this one's for you. Uh, so, you know, if we look at, you know, the responsibility of data management, you know, typically that's, that falls into that HTM manager role or a lead tech. You know, when we think about that expansion of responsibilities of most HTM departments, we talked about cybersecurity is a great example of that, you know, and the, gr the growing importance of having clean data, you know, can you talk a little bit about why it matters to have someone, I know Mark, you mentioned it too, and Blake, you too, having someone truly dedicated with sort of that X on their forehead that says, you own our data management, in some cases, multiple people, you own our data management and you govern it uh, so that it, it not just is set right in the front end, but it's maintained over time. Comments on that, Barbara? Sure, Ben. So, yeah, I think the governance of that is really important. And, you know, depending on the size of your program, it doesn't necessarily have to be someone's full-time job, mm -hmm. but you do need to identify who is ultimately responsible for making sure that data is collected consistently and that the processes are in place to keep that data clean. So it could be, you know, part of someone's job, but I think the most important thing is that you identify who's responsible. Mm -hmm. And certainly if your program's big enough to have one or more dedicated people to that role, you know, that makes them a little more focused and a little more expert in that. But it's something that you could assign and train to, you know, a lead tech or an HTM manager as well. And one of the other things that we found has worked well is there's, you know, certainly someone who's responsible and that's their um, overall uh, responsibility to ensure it happens, but that they put any um, adjustments or improvements to the database through a change management committee, which mm -hmm. has representation from our frontline techs, our managers, our accounting department, our sourcing department, so that we're, we'll know if we're making a change that might affect another department that, you know, that's all talked through before it's implemented. So, you know, I think it's a combination. You don't necessarily need a dedicated person, but you need to identify mm -hmm. who's responsible for which parts of the data. That governance process, Barbara, I love that. I would love to, can you maybe share a little bit of kind of some of the examples? I, I assume makes models, manufacturers, but what, what types of, of data are you running through that governance process? So, I mean, routine changes, you know, would not have to go through the entire committee. So if we're just having... You know, a technician has a new make model to enter. That's mm -hmm. something that through um, permissions, the technician couldn't create a new one, but they would put in a request to our um, data management team. Mm -hmm. They respond usually within an hour or two to, you know, research, make sure it truly is a new one and, and then add it. But if it were a change such as, you know, changing the label on a field or adding a field to, to the work order, let's say, you know, the technicians requested to have a field added for some purpose they're doing. We want to make sure a change like that would go through change management to make sure it's not 
affecting something that say our sourcing department is doing and would have some inadvertent, you know, consequences down the road. That makes a lot of sense, Barbara. I mean, it's, I guess, Blake, let's, uh, any comments on that? Or do you have a similar governance process, similar approach on your side? To a much smaller scale. Uh, my organization is not to the size and scale of either March or Barbara's, but uh, we, we do it more internally uh, with uh, what we're looking at to, to, to Barb's uh, point of, you know, a new make and model. Uh, the technicians do not have that permission. You, you have to really scale back is, is how many fingers are in, in, in your process. And then, you know, uh, researching, you know, the new make and model, does it really not exist or does it exist in a different fashion? Uh, because that was, that, that's one of the big data killers is, oh, I have Carefusion, I have Philips and I have say Viasis and they've all made the exact same model of a device Yet they were, you know, and they are the exact same device, just depends on when they were manufactured and put in and we bought them. Uh, So how do you how do you keep your data clean so that I don't have three different manufacturers with the exact same model, et cetera, or I use aliases for you know, as they've changed, things like that. So uh, uh, maybe it's not so new, but you have to have a process in place in order to to do that uh, upfront proactively versus reacting to when the bad data is already in. It's a great example. Mark, any comments from your side on the similar? It sounds like we've got a real similar alignment as, as Barbara. So we have two full-time database administrators on board, but understand we take care of our, our CMMS for facilities ops and for HTM across the entire enterprise. We also have a layer of project coordinators who kind of do that uh, a variety of different things within the database, including uh, dashboard management, reporting out, et cetera, et cetera. We do also have an exec committee uh, in place for, for change management. Um, so that would be uh, led by one of my section heads who reports directly to me and involvement or membership wise, we'd have multiple unit heads some from different geographies across the enterprise. And then of course the same spread for uh, technicians and then the project coordinators who have their hands and fingers on this data the whole time. So we're a three shield organization, practice education and research. I think we're, we're always looking for ways to change, tweak, uh, reconfigure, et cetera. Uh, and the, the spirit of that within this organization, I think has allowed us to, to build this team and, and really work closely with, with Nuvolo to build it to where it is today. That's great, Mark. Sounds like, like I said, consistency there in that governance process, you know, depending on how many people you can put around it, but the reality is the process is the process that there is governance. And, uh, and again, that way you guys can maintain that data quality over time. Um, let's go into question seven. Carter, I'm going to pull you into this conversation here. It's cybersecurity. We've talked about a little bit as we've gone along here, um, but as you, you know, as you're aware, cybersecurity, you know, was just listed by ECRI as the top health technology hazard in 2022. You know, it's going to be a big focus across the board in healthcare this year, as it, as it has been, honestly, in the last few years. It's certainly a concern for HTM leaders that are like the folks on this call. You know, can you first maybe just start off before we dive a little deeper into the technology side and, and, the, and the business challenges, maybe share a little bit about what First Health Advisory does first, Carter? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And Ben, you know, thank you. And, and you know, to the panel who are clearly very cyber aware, it's, uh, it, it's simply a, a function of the state of, of our healthcare organizations and, you know, what HTM's role is evolving to be. So, I, 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 you know, I feel like I'm surrounded by a bunch of uh, chief security officers here on the call today, but uh, a little context to what First Health uh, Advisory does. We are a healthcare asset centric security and risk advisor and you know, to hundreds of commercial and government healthcare entities. And so the programs that we develop and mature really get to the core of reducing patient safety risk and finding those efficiencies that we've already talked about uh, on this podcast and, and ultimately managing that risk and the life cycle of operational technology. And some thought we were nuts to build a company around this particular challenge years ago, uh, Ben, when you and I started talking. But Mm -hmm. when you understand the business impact of accepting or ignoring risk in this area and begin to view it as a liability to the entire enterprise, it starts to make sense on why you would want to organize a focused 
multidisciplinary team that tracks the technical trends that we've talked about already, the threats, risk exposures, regulations, enforcement, and overall just leading practice. That's what we do for organizations that uh, are, are building maturity and capability into their asset orchestration and, and risk programs. Uh, and lastly, you know, I'll just add that Nuvolo is the centerpiece of the asset risk programs that we support. And we're really encouraged by ECRI uh, in that you're shining a light on these cyber and supply chain hazards mm-hmm. that HPM managers, clinical leadership, IT security, all the way up to the board level should be paying very close attention to. Yeah, Carter, I, I appreciate those comments and I uh, it's been a great relationship here. But Carter, you think about a lot of organizations when cybersecurity became a topic, and WannaCry certainly was one of the big areas when we started talking heavily about this when that came out, you know, a lot of people started started to look for a silver bullet. You know, can I just buy a monitoring and discovery product on the market? The reality is, and, and obviously Barbara, Mark, you know, Blake, you guys have, you have really, you know, looked at this holistically and looked at it from a people, a process, and a technology uh, approach, which I know that's an old term. Let's look at people, process, and tech. But the reality Mm -hmm. is, Carter, what you guys are doing, you're bringing the people and the expertise if organizations don't have it. Now, Mayo, Mark, I know you guys and and Barbara and Blake, you guys have the skilled resources there uh, within your organizations, which is fantastic. A lot of hospitals that don't have that level of expertise. Uh, And Carter, I know that's a big role you you bring to the table for healthcare organizations. Carter, let's dive into the, the, the next question, which I think kind of clicks in a little bit here as it relates to medical device cybersecurity and we call it OT security. It's somewhat the trend there. You know, we've heard it said that OT security experts don't, you you can't defend what you don't know, right? You can't defend what you don't know. Blake was talking about an inaccurate devices in his inventory. He had to go physically walk out and put hands on, right? We talked about uh, WannaCry having to go send teams of people out at Mayo to go physically go put hands on equipment, Right. How, how does having an accurate and complete data in that CMMS ultimately help the HTM departments like the folks on this call, you know, protect those medical devices and, and facilities devices that are connected from those cybersecurity threats? Yeah, uh, you know, we've heard that adage, you know, almost so much it becomes cliche. And I even say it, right? You can't protect what you don't know you have. But ultimately, it's true. And when you think about cybersecurity, when you think about risk, Vulnerability management, responding to incidents, and the list is long, right? You know, Blue Keep, WannaCry, SolarWinds, Raya, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, that data has to provide a complete picture of exactly what you have at that time, not a year ago, not six months ago. And, and it's not just about having the assets inventory, it's about having all the attributes that we talked about earlier in, in the podcast. Uh, you know, from these assets in a single repository that's updated on a regular basis. And, and ideally, it's continuous. Mm-hmm. And, and the reason being is the vulnerabilities are wreaking havoc across the myriad of different assets that HDOs uh, you know, are, are managing. And while knowing what you have is a great starting point, knowing what's under the hood is even better. And those vulnerabilities that affect OT, IoT, medical devices, they may only impact a specific model with a specific application or or, or revision or firmware. And at the level of effort that it takes to analyze and look at those alerts, understand the vulnerabilities, the CVEs, and cross-reference them uh, to the CMMS, it's it's a total quagmire. And and it's so time-consuming. You guys understand this, you know, it's the, the, the manpower, the resources that it takes to cross-reference that if you don't have clean information, complete information, and timely information, it's putting many, many organizations at risk. And I'll just say that the data accuracy, it helps from a life cycle perspective, capital planning, upgrade planning. We've, we've talked about that. There's a whole list of things to think about here, you know, risk assessments, they're not going to be effective if you don't have high fidelity data. Uh, you know, that clean data, it's going to help create baselines. And then you'll start to understand which devices can or cannot, you know, have controls 
applied to them. And you can develop more targeted patching cadences for these devices. Uh, it, it helps identify configuration gaps and issues. I mean, these are you know subjects that we could talk about again for another hour. Mm-hmm. The, I guess the, 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 the lead behind here, it's a lot of work to get clean data into, into the CMMS. And everybody on this podcast knows that. Yet the benefits, including cybersecurity, far outweigh the level of effort to get here. Mm-hmm. Carter, it's a great, a great comment. I think I even heard Mark say we consolidated our CMMSs. We had multiple CMMSs across our hospitals. It, you know, you have to start with the basics. Let's start with getting a single CMMS across our hospital systems. Couldn't tell you how many hospitals are going through acquisitions, right, across the country and been going through acquisitions across the country, right? Multiple CMMS are in play, or there's a CMMS for facilities and a CMMS for clinical engineering. Having that single CMMS in your hospitals is the start of the foundation and the starting point to then grow and build an OT security program around, right? And I think, Carter, that's where you're going with this. You know, let's crawl, let's walk, let's run. And you know, Mark, any comments there from your side? Any any additional thoughts there? Couldn't agree more. I mean, we, we've got the scoring in place already. So I think we're uh, uh, leading edge, uh, maybe not cutting edge, but uh, we started risk scoring uh, for the entire organization years ago. Um, yeah, it all goes back to, to WannaCry. Log4j is the, the most recent one. I haven't heard that one mentioned yet, but um, yeah, we've come a long way. It's mostly driven by cyber. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Carter. So, Carter, let's go to the next question and talk a little about, you know, you think about all these cyber cyber alerts, right? They're coming in from these external sources. You know, we've got these, you know, targeting specific operating systems, patches, upgrades, notifications, even from your manufacturers or OEMs or your service providers, right? Kind of talk about some of those challenges that HDM departments, you know, face, you know, if they don't use standard asset make model, and, you know, naming conventions, kind of what are those challenges? What does that look like? It's an understatement, you know, ultimately uh, in what our, 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 just our field is dealing with. And, you know, Mark said it, right? You know, look no further than what I call the lump of coal vulnerability that we got in our stockings over the holidays, better known as Log 4 j mm-hmm. right? It, it really exposed organizations that don't have standardized naming conventions or clean, you know, a complete data as we talked about already. And, and the resources, you know, not just in clinical engineering, biomed, HTM are stretched so thin in our organizations right now. And the time and effort to cross-reference that information becomes just, just too much. It's too taxing. And it makes it so hard to follow or comply with service level agreements, you know, teams, they just, they, they cannot or, or, or simply just don't track the time and effort to put in the research, let alone getting to remediation and mitigation activities. And so when you roll up all these things, it absolutely increases enterprise risk. And, and so that standardization has a marked impact on documentation efforts, work orders that we talked about, how they're tracked, and just you know, the, the more mature organizations that can then work off the dashboards that, that Barbara was talking about from a security perspective and, and begin to know where you stand on a day-to-day, minute-to-minute basis. That's the goal here, really. That, that's the goal. Mm-hmm. You're spot on, Carter. This is no longer optional, right? This is no longer optional. That's why the governance processes that Mark and Barbara and Blake you're talking about, it's why it's so important that those are working right? That we can have that accurate data now and maintain it. And that this is part of our run book. This is how we run HTM. This is how we run our CMMS. So uh, appreciate those comments, Carter. Just another comment Please. on that. And, you know, and I have to tell you, and I, I think some would be shocked, you know, that are on this podcast, but I've been, you know, kind of challenged by HTM leaders to say, well, I've never heard anybody dying from, you know, ransomware or, or, or a cyber attack. I just don't get this. You know, what, what these tools and all this stuff just seems uh, like a bunch of, you know, smoke and mirrors. And, and I, I say BS to that. You know, there is a lot of growing evidence, objective evidence that when you look at mortality rates, you know, when you look at the diversion of care and what's happening with ransomware and supply chain attacks and the strain that it puts on healthcare systems, 
there is an absolute impact on healthcare outcomes. And, and so I wholly reject that claim that the things that everybody on this podcast are doing and the things that we do as a company are not reducing risk. Totally agree. Does anybody have any comments uh, I'm on that? I'm passionate about that because I I mean, tell, yeah, it's... like two weeks ago, I, I heard that, you know, I haven't seen any harm done by cyber attacks or ransomware or supply chain attacks. And I just, I get fired up when I hear that. <laughs> but just one comment to add. I mean, the, if you look forward, the future of quote unquote, this with data collection and how many attributes you're going to have per device, where this is all going is related to the life cycle of medical equipment and value that is going to be missed or just equipment that can't be had. And what I mean by that is logical segmentation is where we're heading. Um, virtual segmentation, et cetera, call it what you will. Um, identifiers with these pieces of equipment will keep getting more and more extensive. Is it a piece of research equipment? Is it a heart-lung machine that's in a lab uh, working with animals, or is it a heart-lung machine that's in the OR connected to humans? And how you segment that and isolate it and then track it moving forward with future segmentation strategies, which we've been working on here for a couple of years. So it's just the beginning is what I have to say with how much data, how accurate it has to be, and how many attributes are going to be connected per device. Yeah, and I understand Carter's frustration because I think... um, well, some people might be skeptical about the likelihood of a really dramatic event where someone's going to, you know, hack into a, a pacemaker and change its operation. While it's been shown those things can happen, a, l- a lot of the more likely scenarios relate to the availability and integrity of data and having a system hacked or, be- or made unavailable and that impacting patient care. So I think those are the kind of scenarios that, you know, really drive it home for me as being more likely and just having a big impact on patient safety. So ones that we have to defend against. And I can say from ECRI's, sorry, but I was going to say from ECRI's mm-hmm. perspective as well, we do have examples of actual patient harm. And in our top 10 list, one of the reasons we named cybersecurity number one is those examples. So um, they're certainly available. That's, that's a great point. That is a great point. Um, if we look at the last question here, Carter, I'm going to have for you, and we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about ECRI because actually it's a nice lead in there. You know, we think about this complete data, Carter, in your CMMS, you know, asset information, make model equipment type, you know, where this device is. We talked about RTLS here earlier and some of that critical information around capital planning and, and, and utilization, you know, what, what technician supports it, when's the PM do, all those things that we care about, right? Oh, t- you know, today we know it's equally important that cybersecurity, we have a complete data set. And then we kind of touched on this a little bit as we've gone through these last few questions especially the network ones. And the volume of network devices per bed continues to increase, right? And Carter, I think you've got the right numbers it's between 10 and 20. I believe it's somewhere around there. You're probably a more accurate number than I have of connected devices per bed in a hospital, right? And so now we think about it. Can you explain a little bit around you know, why having all of this information is so important? You know, a lot of times you mentioned it's, it's sort of overlooked. Why having this, you know, I'll call it, you know, critical network information about these connected devices operating system, IP addresses, MAC addresses, firmware version, whether it's source PHI, like Barbara used that example earlier. Why is that information so important in running a cybersecurity program, obviously, but why else is that important in your eyes, Carter? You know, and Mark said it, there's 412 attributes that they're tracking. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the, the, the importance, uh, it, it's far reaching. These elements help comply with frameworks that we want to align with. Uh, service level agreements, application management, service improvement, incident response time. Uh, you know, there's so much uh, to, mm-hmm. to unpack there. Uh, and I'll add that there's great work you know, from, from all of the stakeholders in the industry that, are, that care about this issue uh, with software bill of materials. And we're mm-hmm. involved in, in tracking this closely, but it's going to take time for that to mature. And, and we don't have that time. I mean, ransom, supply chain attacks, breaches, talent shortages, all the things that we've talked about here are going to make this issue, this challenge even more acute in the next couple of years. And, and we need to be prepared for it. 
Mark, you have anything to comment there? Yeah, like? just uh, you know, some phrases that we use around here: uh, threat vector, attack surface, pivot point. So you can build the best fence in the world, but if you you leave a section out, you're, you're vulnerable, right? So that's what comes to mind with me right away with this stuff. Um, we uh, HTM CE leaders don't want to be the one who uh, you know sunk the ship let ransomware and whatever it might be, or let ransomware get in and propagate. So I feel very, very passionately about that myself. I'm sure this is one of the items that keeps everyone up at night on this call. Absolutely. It's definitely cause for a lot of gray hair <laughs> on my head. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's dive in, Tom. I want to bring you into the conversation here. Uh, and I, I think we think about the cybersecurity, we think about data standardization, you know, ECRI is a great partner, um, but you want to tell us a little bit about ECRI's role in the standardization of medical device naming conventions? Absolutely. So, you know, thank you for asking me to join, by the way, and it's been a great conversation. I'm proud to represent ECRI in, in this world. So, you know, as an independent resource organization, ECRI recognized this dirty data issue many years ago in dealing with all of our members and biomeds. And obviously what we want to do is serve our members and you know, really promote patient care um, and, and reduce patient risk. So when we started doing, you know, many years ago, what we're known for is one of the things is alerts and recalls and, and recall management, um, you know, in order to do matching of alerts to inventory. So instead of just getting a list of alerts, actually saying you're affected by this one, you have this in inventory, we recognize the need to actually clean inventories. And so for many years now, We've been receiving dirty data from our member facilities. Um, I've probably seen hundreds of variations um, many different files, many different ranges of dirtiness. And so what we provide now is a standard manufacturer, a standard model name, and a standard nomenclature, which is our UMDNS, Universal Medical Device Nomenclature System. And so we're able to receive that, we're able to analyze it, and then provide back clean data, which, you know, doing a lot of the work, as we talked about, that ends up, techs end up doing, and a lot of cost and effort. And, um, you know, we're able to provide that service for many of our members. It's great. It's a great service. And, you know, it's quite a topic, Tom, that I hear a lot about is you have any way to automate that data cleanup, right? All right. How do I, how do I start from a clean slate? You know, I have all this data. I want to standardize it, you know? So um, Nuvolo and Ecri recently released an integration, right? So we're now tied together, you know, ultimately helping HTM departments automate this process, right? It needs to be easy. I need to be able to clean that data. So when I go live, I now have a standard to start from. As Mark and Barbara and Blake have said, not only start from, but then obviously govern and manage it going forward. Talk a little bit about how that process works, Tom, so that organizations can get a get an onboarding cleaning process going, and then even potentially on in an ongoing basis as well. Yeah, absolutely, and we're extremely excited to work with Nubolo on this. And so, as I said, for many years we've been cleaning large data sets, and it's simply just an Excel and export, you know, from a CMMS system. And so. What we developed with Nuvolo is an API. And so we're able to get data directly in from Nuvolo um, into our system, provide those standards, and then have that retrieved directly um, by the Nuvolo system and populate fields there. So instead of having to import anything special or do any exports or big data sets, we're able to have that direct tie in. Um, any new purchases, you know, we, we get you to a certain level of cleanliness. And then obviously, what we'll call a maintenance going forward, new purchases, I believe, Blake commented on that, new purchases, changes, mergers from manufacturers, you're able to provide that to ECRI, we can provide that standard information and populate right back into the Nivolo system. That's great. And, you know, Tom, as you think about that standard data aligned to UMDNS, to your point, those safety and recalls now can do that auto matching, right? If they're aligned to your data standards, when you think about a safety and recall, why not automate that as well? Why not automatically notify that this make and model, this number of devices was affected by this make and model of recall, uh, our safety alert, you know, that's all can be automated now because it's aligned to an industry standard, you know. Exactly. So question, last question, Tom, I think for you is how many medical device alerts and recalls does ECRI send out every year? Yeah, unfortunately, too many, I'll say. Um, right now, we're doing between 2,000 and 2,500 medical device recalls and actions every year. Um, now, some of them are straight recalls. Some of them are security issues. We also do what I call ECRI exclusive reports. So they may be research done by our project officers in-house. Um, they may be problem reports from members. They may be warnings from FDA recalls. So there's a lot of different variations of this. Of those 2,000 medical device recalls, probably a little bit less than half are actually affecting equipment. And so they may be safety issues. They may be software updates. They may be use cases. 
Um, and so, and we're also doing other types of recalls as well, pharmaceuticals, food, things like that. So it's a large number. Part of the reason why we started promoting this data standardization and auto matching is because, you know, it's just too much for one person to handle without some sort of automation. And so that's why, you know, we're really excited about this and, and, you know, our customers really love the value we're bringing them. It's great. It's amazing. I had no idea it was that, that kind of volume. It's unbelievable. What an event today. I, uh, if you guys can't tell, like data standardization is the foundation that CMMS systems need to have, right? As we think about all aspects of it, we, we touched on, I think every major part, I know we could have spent hours on each and every one of them, but you think about op, how we run our op, operations, how clinical engineers do their day jobs, how you report on your compliance, your overall operational metrics, your financials, OT security and protecting your medical equipment, right? Safety and recall alerts and data standardization there with ECRI. You guys, I wanna thank this entire panel for taking this time today. Uh, and for participating in this podcast. Uh, hopefully this is helpful for everyone that was able to join uh, today and uh, you know, certainly uh, look forward to having additional conversations around this exact topic. With that, uh, we're going to wrap up the call. I want to thank everyone uh, for your time and, and attention on the call, but uh, have a great rest of your day and uh, we'll talk real soon. Thank you to our panelists for a great presentation. If you enjoyed today's episode, you might enjoy our ongoing webinar series Webinar Wednesday. You can find a calendar of upcoming live webinars as well as an archive of on-demand webinars at webinarwednesday.live. To obtain your certificate for one CE credit, please remember to click the link located below this podcast title to complete today's survey. If you have any questions, please contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com.